All right. Um, let's take a moment to pray together um, before we get into this course, uh, this lecture. Uh, may I request somebody to please um, pray with us and uh, then we will get started. Uh, can I pray, Pastor? Please go ahead, Abhishek. Okay. Holy Father, we come to your holy presence right now in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord. Uh, and bless Pastor, Lord. Uh, give him the wisdom, understanding, and revelation that he may teach us and taught about the subject of holiness, Lord. And help us, whatever we listen today, Lord, that we may understand it and we may walk in it, Lord Jesus. Help us to walk. Give us the grace to walk in the path of holiness, Lord. And uh, remove every form of distraction uh, from the classroom, Lord. And bless each one of us, Lord. Thank you, Father, for hearing this prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Well, once again, welcome to this lecture on holiness and uh, just going to quickly review what we did um, last Wednesday and then we're going to go forward. So we are now right now in the section, this is actually the last section or the third section, um, where we are talking about overcoming. Uh, how do we practically overcome, uh, live the overcoming life? How do we practically overcome uh, the flesh, the world, and the devil, so that we can live holy lives. So uh, we said that these are three big things that try to pull us down. Our own flesh, the world, the influence of the world around us, and of course the devil. So we began last week in this section, section three, by just emphasizing that all of us as believers, we can live the overcoming life. We are all born of God, we overcome, and uh, our salvation includes a life of victory. Uh, Jesus is our model. Uh, we walk in victory through faith in God. We can all live a victorious, overcoming life in Christ. So in order to do that, there are two important aspects that we must be anchored in. We must be very strong in. That is the cross. We must be fully established in what Jesus did on the cross. Right? And we must be uh, uh, convinced that this is a completed work. You know, uh, that Jesus didn't leave anything unfinished in that sense or on the cross. What, whatever he was needed for us to recover from the fall, Jesus finished on the cross. So we must be so established in that. Secondly, we must be established in our identity in Christ. Uh, and these are things we are we have gone into detail or in separate courses uh, we have a course on uh, the covenants the cross and the blood uh, where you know in detail we go into talking about the covenants the cross and the blood and then we have a separate course on our identity in Christ so those are things we must be well established in but it is on the basis of the cross and our identity in Christ that we are going to live overcoming lives, right? So the, here, uh, we're just doing a very brief review uh, where we're emphasizing the fact that on the cross, the power of sin was broken. And this truth must be so established in us. You know, there should be no doubt. And it should, it should so fill us that if we find anything that's controlling us, we must be willing to go against it on the basis of the cross of Jesus Christ, right? Because that's the basis for our victory, that on the cross, the power of sin over our lives was broken. And so we go against every sin that might try to hold us down through the power of the cross. So we must be really established. We must be really convinced about this truth, right? It's not just um, that... Uh, God has let, left us alone uh, to be on our own and just try to figure a way out to overcome sin. No, God has broken the power of sin through what Christ did on the cross. And so on that basis, we are contending overcoming sin, right? 
So um, Romans 8, 3, what the law could not do, it was weak through the flesh. God did. So God did. Yeah, that's just amazing. God did it by sending his own son in the flesh. And he condemned sin in the flesh. See, the law could not help us. The law couldn't. The law only told us this is right, this is wrong. The law said, "Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not uh, steal." You know, the law told us what not to do, but it couldn't help us uh, because our flesh was weak. Our flesh was sin controlled. So, you know, there's, we were helpless. But that's when God did the work. What did He do? He sent His Son in the flesh. And he condemned sin in the flesh. That means Christ destroyed sin. And we are walking in that. We are walking in his finished work on the cross. And so you and I must be so established. The second part of the cross is on the cross, Satan was defeated. And so uh, we, we must be absolutely established in that fact. And when we contend with the things of the devil, the devil is going to come against us with his temptations, but we counteract or we counter those things on the fact that Christ has defeated Satan on the cross. So Satan has no right over us. He cannot hold us in bondage. He may want to do it. He may try to do it, but we must be so established in this truth that Christ defeated Satan on the cross so we can walk in victory over the devil. We don't have to be in bondage. Right? So that's the second truth. We must be established. Also the cross is the basis for our redemption. And our redemption means we are delivered from the powers of darkness. Uh, we are no longer in subject to the powers of darkness through the cross of Christ. Be established in that. And then, like we said, we also must be established in our identity in Christ. That we have a new life in Christ. And this new life is the very life of God in us. Uh, this, this new life is created in righteousness and holiness. Uh, this life has you know, given us access into the presence of God. And uh, so much more. That we are uh, in a place of authority and we have been anointed in power of the Holy Spirit. So that knowing our identity is so important. And it's on the basis of these two things. You know, it's on the basis of the cross and our identity. You and I are going to contend for a life of holiness. Okay. Now, I, of course, I've not gone into all the details on these two things. But what I want to emphasize is... A life of holiness is possible. A life of overcoming sin, a life of overcoming temptation, a life of overcoming Satan is possible because of the cross and because of our identity in Christ. So that's what God has done for us. And then God has given us the means to apply that into every situation. How does that happen? It's going to be as we use the word of God, right? So, again, this is something we know, but this is something we have to apply in our lives. That God has finished the work for me, but now I have to take, I have to take the word of God. I have to take what God has spoken in his word and I have to use it in my battle against sin, against temptation, against Satan. So using the word is something I have to do, right? God uh, will, sorry, this last Sunday is because it was taken from a sermon note. So, so God will not do this for me, right? I have to do this. I have to take the word and I have to fight. Right? So uh, John is writing to the young man or people who are spiritually in that stage. And he says, young man, 
you are strong. The word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. So what is key to them overcoming the wicked one? They are strong because the word of God abides in them. So the word of God is in them. So I must understand that one of the ways you and I are going to fight against sin or temptation in our lives is by intentionally using the word of God. Right? So the word of God is our sword. The word of God is the source of our strength in our battle against temptation or sin. So for that, what must I do? I must feed my inner person with the word of God. Right? So nobody else can do this for me. Just as in the natural, nobody can eat your breakfast, lunch, and dinner for you. You have to go and eat your breakfast, your lunch, your dinner. I mean, you have to consume that physical food uh, for your, phys your physical body. Somebody else can't do it for you. In the same way, if I'm going to live victorious over sin, I have to feed my inner person with the word. Nobody can do it for me. God has made the word available, but I need to spend the time to feed my person, inner person with the word of God. Right? So this is part of a life of victory. Now, Paul wrote in Acts 20, verse 32. He said, I'm commending you to God and to the word, to the word of his grace. This is able to build you up, make you strong, and give you an inheritance. That means it's going to help you and me possess, walk in our inheritance. So the word of God builds us up and gives us an inheritance, right? So why is it that believers are weak against temptation, against sin, against what the devil does in trying to pull them down, or against the influence of the world? So we said, you know, the flesh, the world, the devil. Up, trying to pull us down. So why are believers weak? Why do we fall? Because one reason, one reason, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying this is the only reason, but one reason is because we're not feeding our inner person with the word of God to build us up. So that we can you know, walk in our inheritance as people who are sanctified, right? as that we are holy people. So if I don't feed myself with the word of God, if I'm not hearing the word, listening to the word, meditating in the word, feeding my spirit with the word, uh, you know, I'm going to be weak and I'm going to be easily pulled down either by my own flesh or by the influence of the world, or by the devil. Right? So this is something uh, we need to tell people, we need to emphasize people, uh, emphasize for people, and you know, constantly feed your spirit with the word of God. Secondly, we must renew our mind with the word. So I'm feeding my inner person with the word, but my mind has to be renewed with the word. That means my thinking has to be aligned to the word. Because, you know, when we talk about temptation a little later on, in a, in a coming chapter, the attack is in the mind. The thoughts come in the mind, right? The, the, the devil is attacking us and with thoughts and with ideas in the mind. And if our mind is 
not renewed with the word of God, it's not thinking aligned to the word, then what happens? It's easy for those thoughts to pull us down in the mind. And then we fall. We fall. But if my mind is renewed with the word, the moment the wrong thought comes, the moment that tempting thought comes, the moment the worldly influence comes, the moment the reasoning from the enemy comes, my mind is renewed with the word. I say, no, that's not God. That, that idea, that thought is not God. So sorry. I'm not accepting it. I'm not going to give room to that thought. So a renewed mind is able to recognize a wrong thought, a wrong idea, a wrong reasoning and disregard it right away, disregard it. But if a mind is not renewed with the word of God, what will happen? That wrong thought, wrong idea will come in, take root and pull the person down. So that's another reason why uh, many believers are still, you know, uh, are struggling with the flesh or the world or the devil because the mind is not renewed. And, and Paul makes it very clear here in Romans 12 too, you know, says don't be conformed to this world. So don't let the influence of the world, you know, mold you, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind so that you can prove or uh, know by testing what is good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So a renewed mind is able to do that. It's able to prove what is acceptable to God. So obviously the mind has to do with thoughts. So when a wrong thought comes, the renewed mind can prove that that wrong thought is displeasing to God. It's not the perfect will of God. It's not acceptable to God or good before God. The renewed mind can immediately prove that and then disregard it. Right, so this is so important. Right, it's in the mind, the renewed mind. We have to renew our mind to the word of God. Thirdly, we have to speak the word, and all of us understand the importance. That means when uh, I feel something, either my flesh or the influence of the world or the temptation of the enemy, something from the enemy is coming against me. The way I counter that, I go against it, is I have to speak the word, take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And it's very interesting, you know, when we uh, look uh, and look at how uh, in the book of Revelation, there's a sword going out of the mouth of God. Uh, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, which is the word of God. So his word, it's, it's so, you know, it's uh, the, the picture that's used is a sword coming out of his mouth. That's his word. And the Bible is telling us that we must take. So we must take the sword of the spirit. So how are we going to take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God? Well, the same way he, the Lord does, which is he speaks it with his mouth. He speaks it with his mouth. So you and I must learn to speak the word of God with our lips, declare this is what the word of God says. Um, when we see you know, either the flesh, the world or the devil coming against us. See, these three points that, um, you know, that, that we just went through right now, it's simple, but it's so powerful. So powerful. Simple. Feed your inner person with the word. Renew your mind with the word. Speak the word. We've all heard, you know, many, many sermons on these three things. But it's these simple things that actually help us overcome the flesh, the world, the devil. It's the simple thing. 
of feeding on the word, renewing my mind with the word and speaking the word, that's key to overcoming the flesh, the world, the devil. So we need to practice it because this is what God has given to us uh, as a means to uh, overcome the enemy. So uh, let me just pause here for a moment before I go forward. Everybody's with me so far? Yes, Pastor. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Okay, thank you. So it's a simple thing, but it's what we have to do. It's what God has given to us. The next one is walking in the spirit. Uh, we'll spend some time on this because um, we need to learn how to do it. So God has given us just, just these two simple things. Now, of course, we will talk about, you know, the getting help or fellowship, being in godly fellowship, which is important. But these are two main things that you and I can do personally to live the overcoming life. First one is the word of God. Use the word of God, which we all understand. It's very simple. You read the word, you feed your spirit with the word, renew your mind with the word, speak the word. The second important key that God has given to us to live victorious, to live, as a, live the overcoming life is to walk in the spirit. And I really want us to understand this. We don't want us to understand this. Because this is probably something... Uh, we may not, we don't necessarily fully understand what does it mean to walk in the spirit? You see, a believer is born again. He can either walk in the flesh or he can walk in the spirit. A believer who's walking according to the flesh is called a carnal Christian. Why? Because he's walking according to the flesh. Or a believer can walk according to the spirit. And a believer who walks according to the spirit is the believer who lives a victorious overcoming life. A believer who walks according to the flesh, Paul says, he's going to end up in death. Okay. So we're going to look at this in the scriptures right and what we must learn is what does it mean to walk according to the spirit when i say to the holy spirit what does it mean to walk according? okay so i i heard some i heard some notifications on the on the on the classroom so let me see here okay uh, um sri kumar you have your hand raised please go ahead thank you pastor uh Pastor, I just want to know uh, that, uh, as you said, uh, a believer who walk in the flesh. Uh, but in the Second Corinthians um, uh, ten three, uh, Paul says that uh, for though we live in the uh, in the you know, in KJV, it says that even though even though we walk in the flesh. So what exactly that means? Like uh, you know, mm. even though we walk in the flesh, but we do mm. not walk after the flesh. Thank you, Pastor. That's my question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3, Paul says, Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. So there he's saying, look, uh, there the flesh is used uh, not in a negative sense, but to talk about the fact that we live natural lives. Right? That means, yeah, we are living natural lives. So for instance, so the word flesh uh, can be used in a wrong sense, in a sense of being subject to the carnal evil desires. But the word flesh is the same Greek word, sarx, is used you know, to refer to the flesh of animals that are sold to the market. It is also used to refer to flesh as in living the normal natural life. So depending on the context that same greek word 
has to be understood differently. So for example, I'll just uh, give you the example. Um, if you go to uh, 1 Timothy, uh, okay, no, 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 let's see. Um, mm -hmm. uh, not that. Oh, well, let me go to Acts then. I was trying to give you examples of how that same word is used uh, in uh, different ways. Let me just look it up here. Um, um, and, sorry. Um, let me look it up. Okay. Um, all right. So, um, John chapter six and verse 51, Jesus is saying, yeah, I think John six will get both examples. Uh, John 6, 51, Jesus said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Okay, so here's one example where the word flesh, right? And, uh, uh, I, and I think I'm just going off in a little direction here, but I will look it up john and just share it with you john 6 51 kjv okay so let me just share my screen with you so uh, it might be easier to um, explain what i'm saying all right, so um, I just opened eSword on my laptop. So you see here, John 6, 51, Jesus is saying, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread which I will give him is my flesh. That word flesh is the same Greek word sarx, right? And if you look up at the Greek word uh, here, you can see that it's a generic word, flesh. It refers to the meat of an animal. It refers to the human body. Or it's a symbol or an image of the uh, the human nature, which is, you know, the moral passions and so on. So that same word, sarx, can refer to uh, animal meat. It can refer to body, the natural life, or it can also refer to moral passions, that same word. And depending on the context, we'll have to interpret it, right? So now Jesus in John 6, 51, he's saying, you know, I will give my flesh. Uh, that's, he's referring to his own person. Obviously, we are not going to eat his physical body, but he's saying, you know, I am the living bread and the bread I'm giving is my own body. So we are going to partake of what he finishes for us in his own body. That is what he provides for us through his body, the sacrifice that he gives for us in his body. And it has nothing to do with uh, you know, eating his physical flesh, but it's talking about the provision he makes through his body. Now in that same chapter, John 6, if you go down to verse 63, he once again uses the word flesh, but the context is different. He says, it is spirit who quickens the flesh. Okay, again, it's the same word, sarx. The flesh profits nothing, right? Uh, uh, and uh, so on. So here, the flesh is talking about the humanness, the natural self. Okay, and then, uh, of course, uh, in Galatians five, the word flesh is, and also in Romans eight, 
and the word flesh is referred to talking about the works of the flesh. Right here it says, the works of the flesh. Again, it's the same Greek word, sarps, but now he's talking about the moral nature of the flesh, and he talks about adultery, fornication, uh, all of those things. Right. So, so to answer your question, uh, uh, when Paul is talking in Second Corinthians ten three, when he says, "For though we walk in the flesh," that means it's the natural body. Of course, we all live in the natural body. Uh, it's it's not referring to the moral or um, the the sinful passions of the flesh. He's just saying we we walk in the flesh. That's the difference. Thank you, Pastor. Thanks a lot. Yeah. So. Um, how did we get into this? Um, oh, we were talking about walking in the spirit. All right. So we were talking about walking in the spirit versus walking in the flesh. So a believer, a believer can either be walking according to the flesh, then we call him a carnal believer. And a believer who walks according to the flesh is a believer who is living a life that is defeated. That means he is controlled by uh, the sinful passions. Whereas a believer who is walking according to the spirit, he is going to live a victorious life. So, what I wanted to say, what I, I guess, well, yeah, we started by saying to live an overcoming life, we must learn how to walk in the spirit. Now, many times when we, when we, when the moment we talk about walking in the spirit, especially in traditional Pentecostal circles, they immediately think about speaking in tongues and, you know, just getting into a frenzy. But that's not walking in the spirit, right? Walking in the spirit is learning to keep our whole person under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And when we walk in the spirit, keep our whole person under the influence of the Holy Spirit, we're going to be able to overcome the flesh, the world, and the devil. Okay, so we're going to spend a little bit of time on this. Now, in the previous chapter, when I talk about using the word, uh, uh, you know, we went through it very quickly because that's something we all understand. We know how to do it. But in this chapter, on, I'll share my screen now, on uh, walking in the spirit. This is a, this is something. We all must learn to do. What, what does it mean? And how do I practically walk in the Spirit? So we'll spend some time on this. Let's go to Romans chapter 8, please. And somebody could read for us Romans 8, verses 1 through 14, or even 1 through 13 is good. Romans 8, 1 through 13, somebody could read that for us, please. Paul, a born servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. Romans, uh, uh, Romans chapter 8. 8 oh, uh, 1 to 13, please. Yes, so, Romans 8, chapter 1 to 13. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. What the law could not do in, the, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of, his, or in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh but those who live according to the spirit the things of the spirit 
for to be carnally minded is death but to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity against god for it is not subject to the law of god nor indeed can be so then those who are in the flesh cannot please god but you are not in the flesh but in the spirit if indeed the spirit of god dwells in you now if anyone does not have the spirit of christ is not is and if christ is in you the body is dead because of sin but the spirit is life because of righteousness but if the spirit of him who raised jesus from the dead dwells in you he who raises raised christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you therefore brethren we are debtors not to the flesh to live according with the flesh for if you live according with the flesh you will die but if if by spirit you put to death the deeds of the body you will live mm thank you Amen. thank you no it's it's um it's very interesting i mean if you if we you know if we have time to just study these these 13 verses if you contrast if you contrast there, there are two things he's talking really two things he's talking about one is according to the spirit according to the flesh that's a, like the two distinctions he's drawing right from verse 1 according to the spirit according to the flesh that means to be according to the spirit that means we are conducting everything in life from by and through the holy spirit so when you segregate you know the, the what the phrases he uses according to the spirit according to the flesh then if it's according to the spirit uh you mind the things of the spirit if you're according to the flesh you mind the things of the flesh verse 5 if you're according to the spirit he says you are in the spirit if you're according to the flesh you are in the flesh if you're according to the spirit he says verse 13 you are by the spirit uh if and of course if you're in the flesh you are according to the flesh so to be according to the spirit is you are minding the things of the spirit your mind is set on things of the spirit you are in the spirit and you are by the spirit everything about life is originating from the holy spirit on the contrary a believer who is according to the flesh he is minding the things of the flesh he cannot please god his mind is at enmity with god he is carnally minded and ultimately he says that he, this person is living according to the flesh and verse 13 he will die that means he's he's is going down the path that's going to lead him to death and he's writing to believers so a believer can make the choice he's either going to walk according to the spirit or he's going to walk according to the flesh okay so keep these thoughts in mind if i'm according to the spirit i'm going to mind the things of the spirit that means my affections my thoughts are going to be on things that are pleasing the holy spirit and if i am a core walk according to spirit i am actually in the spirit so that's being in the spirit and if i am in the spirit i am also living by the spirit that's verse 13 by the spirit that's i'm drawing my strength i am um, uh, moving and operating by the holy spirit okay now the but two parallel passages, I hope you'll have time to read this. If you go with me, please, to Galatians 5, verses 
I don't know if we have time, but let's do it. Galatians 5, 16 to 26, please. Somebody could read that for us. Galatians 5, 16 to 26. Shall I read first? Please go ahead, yeah. Galatians chapter 5, 16 to 26. I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts after, for the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, rivalries, and like and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in the time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Amen. Hmm. All right. So once again, he's contrasting life in the spirit versus life according to the flesh. Now notice how in... Uh, and he uses different phrases. In verse 16, he talks about walk in the Spirit. Verse 18, be led by the Spirit. Verse 25, live in the Spirit. So he's telling the believer, walk in the Spirit, be led by the Spirit, and live in the Spirit. So the problem then, verse 17, the flesh is against the Spirit. You know, the flesh has its desires. The spirit has its desires. So in, in, in verse 17, the spirit is capitalized. Now, in the Greek, it says pneuma. So the, so the, tron uh, the translators felt we should capitalize it. But even if you look at it as a small s, it's correct. I mean, it's... Uh, uh, it, it will not contradict the, the Greek, right? So whether if it's a capitalist or a small s, it's fine. The message is the flesh is desiring things that are opposite to what the human spirit who is indwelt by the Holy Spirit is desiring. So that, he says, you cannot do the things you wish. That means in your spirit, you really want to do the right things. You want to do things that are holy. You want to do things that are pure and acceptable and pleasing to God in your spirit. But the problem is there's a the flesh. The flesh is desiring things that are opposite to what the spirit inside desires. And then he says, look, this is what the flesh will do. And he gives a list of things there, verses 19 to 21. And you notice there are certain things that, that don't seem like very bad. Like he's talking about hatred. You know, if somebody has hatred, it's inside their heart. You don't necessarily see it expressed outside all the time. Or jealousy, it's hidden inside them, right? Or selfish ambition, that's again inside. You don't always see it in like, you know, a murder or something. Or division, you know, somebody causing division between people, you see? Or, you know, envy. And, and then he says, and the like, meaning this list is longer than just what's listed here. So anything that's contrary to God, that's the work of the flesh. And also the warning is very strong, verse 21. 
those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That means as a believer, I can't practice these things. Not, it's not part of a believer's life. So, but the fruit of the spirit, that means if I'm really living out of that spirit within me, the Holy Spirit on my spirit, then you're going to see the expressions of love and joy and peace and um, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. And we're going to see all these things happening in the life of the believer. Verse 24. Those who are Christ's, they have crucified the flesh. So the flesh is having wrong desires, but with the help of the Holy Spirit, I put it put to death these wrong desires, crucify the flesh with its passions and desires. And this is just like what we read in Romans 8 13. If you buy the spirit to put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So what does it mean to walk in the spirit? He uses different terms here. He says, walk in the spirit, be led by the spirit, live in the spirit. And we will, we will kind of get into it, get understanding this. But what I want us to understand is there are the flesh, that is the natural passions and desires of the natural human body. The flesh desires things that are wrong. But as we walk in the spirit, we are able to put an end to these things. Been able to put an end to every expression of the flesh. And that's the life we are called to live. So what we need to understand is, how do we walk in the Spirit? So, you know, we saw in Romans 8, we also saw in Galatians 5, that both these passages are telling us, if you walk in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you walk in the spirit, you will you'll bring an end to these sinful desires. So the question we need to understand or answer and understand is, you know, what does it mean to walk in the spirit? And how do I practically do it in day-to-day -day life? So that when my flesh is pulling against me, or when my flesh is being drawn to the attractions of the world, or when Satan's temptations are trying to pull on my fleshly desires, I will still learn to walk in the spirit and overcome the flesh. Okay. So that's what we need to understand. That's what we must learn to live. That's how we must learn to live as believers. If we are going to live an overcoming victorious life. So we'll continue this on. Wednesday. Uh, any questions so far? Okay, I see a question from Abhishek. Pastor, here death means the person will go to hell. Well, I would answer that by saying there are stages. So, first, death we must understand as decay and corruption. And then the second is, yes, it's eternal hell. So what do we mean by the first part? Um, Galatians 6, Paul says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that's what he will reap. If you sow to the Spirit, you will reap of the Spirit everlasting life. But if you sow to the flesh, You'll reap death. You'll of the spirit of the flesh reap corruption, death. So there, what we, we you know, so what what happens is, if if a believer is living according to the flesh, the initial outcome is he's going to be reaping those things, things that are actually destructive, destroying to his life. That's the first result. Ultimately, it's going to lead to hell. Right? At some point, and we don't know when, but at some point, if he's going to continue like this, living according to the flesh, because Paul said, you know, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. 
So it's very clear. So if he's going to continue living according to the flesh at some point, he's going to cross that line where the, what, what God gave him, the gift of salvation, is going to be forfeited and he's going to face the eternal consequences of that kind of a life. Okay. So it doesn't mean immediately, immediate, the immediate res, re, result is he's going to experience the problems resulting from doing things of the flesh. But eternal or consequently, he will face that. Okay. Beth's question. I see sinful nature in believers and non-believers, and I see the fruit of the Spirit in believers and non-believers too. So, the, the sinful nature, what we're talking about is, you know, the fleshly nature. The expression of the passions of the flesh, flesh, the body, the flesh. It's in every person. Because all of us have this, this natural body, which has been trained and accustomed to and is brought up in this world. So, believer or non-believer, we all have the same flesh, the body. But hopefully with time, the believer's flesh is crucified with its passions and its desires. Now, the fruit of the Spirit that we see, which is the expressions of love and joy and peace, uh, can come from two, two sources, right? One, it could be the working of the Holy Spirit in the believer, expressing love and joy and peace. Two, the second, one is, it could be a soulless expression, meaning any person, believer or non-believer, can show empathy, can show kindness, can show, you know, compassion. That is the soulless expression. It's coming from the soul. Any person can do that. So, you can see a non-believer, unsaved person being kind. They may do kind deeds or speak kind, whatever. Just fine. That is, God has created a spirit, soul, and body, and uh, they're able to, you know, uh, express that feeling through their their emotions, the soul. But then there is a limit, and it's not coming forth from the Holy Spirit. A believer, if a believer is living under or walking in the Spirit, as we are saying, he is going to manifest love and joy. But that's what refers to as a fruit of the Spirit. It's, it's the Holy Spirit birthing that through the person. And there is a place where you can see the distinction. And the distinction, hopefully, is this. That the believer is able to do good to those who offend him. That the believer is able to forgive those who hurt him. In the world, we do good to those who are good to us or those who may not harm us. But if people harm us, we could retaliate. But the believer is so empowered by the Holy Spirit that he should be in a position to love his enemies, do good to those who persecute him do good to those who hurt him. And that's where we see the distinction. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so Chaya, your question, uh, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Yeah, so, you know, the flesh has its desires, uh, but then, if I let, but I, uh, we must learn to live from the Holy Spirit, live of the Spirit. Okay. The flesh has its weaknesses. If I yield to that, then I will live according or express according 
I express that weakness. But if I live of the spirit, I'll be able to overcome the weakness of the flesh. Okay. Uh, last question. Beth, can we say testing is a place where we know if fruit of the spirit is soulish or spirit led? Yeah. So when 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 we get to that place where, you know, we reach a limit of uh, where the human soul can go, that's where we see the distinction where something is from the Holy Spirit. You know, I mean, I, I just want to just as a reference, as an example, you think about Graham Staines and. Uh, his wife, Gladys Danes. You know, what Gladys Danes experienced, just, you know, for her husband and her children to be burnt alive. And then for Gladys Danes to be able to say, you know, I forgive. I mean, that's amazing. That's what the Holy Spirit can empower somebody to do. And, and and so that's just an example in real life where you go beyond what uh, what the human soul can accomplish. So on Wednesday, we're going to continue this and talk about what does it mean to walk in the Spirit? What does it mean to live by the Spirit so that the flesh, that we crucify the flesh with its passions and desires? Galatians 5.24. Right? What is it? How do we do it? Right? So let's close for today. Uh, may I request somebody to pray with us and dismiss us. And we'll pick this up on Wednesday. Okay. Pastor, can I pray? Pastor, can I pray? Okay. okay. Anyone? Go ahead. Our Lord and most, just, most gracious Father, we give you praise and honor this morning. We thank you for the gift of life once again we thank you for the opportunity to sit under your feet oh god and be ministered unto through your servants pastor ashes father we pray commit whatever that we have shared and we have received from you this morning lord we pray for grace to enable us to be transformed by the power of your word Father, we pray the Lord, as we step into another week, may our steps be guided so that they enable us to walk in the Spirit and not yield to the passions of our flesh. We thank you and we bless your holy name. Continue to preserve us, O God, by your power and by your Spirit. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. We pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day, and I'll see you tomorrow. God bless. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. God bless. God bless you all. See you tomorrow. God bless.